So, um, as many of you probably know, there are 127,000 people in the UK with um, Parkinson's. Um, and like many of you, um, so too is, is my, my friend, Jan Strickling, um, who used to be a ballet dancer. In, uh, he was a, a virtuoso ballet dancer. Um, and um, so he asked me to, um, he's been encouraging me to get involved with this research. Um, and um, as we are all acutely aware, it's currently incurable. So like many people, what I'd like to do is to try to use the skills I have as a mathematician and engineer um, to help find a cure for this um, disease somehow. And so I had to just um, step back and just, you know, come at this from a, from a very broad overview. The first question, of course, is what exactly causes Parkinson's? Well, that's a complicated question, but I don't want to dumb it down. But, well, the proximal cause is that dopaminergic um, neurons in the substantia nigra eventually begin to die. Um, and perhaps that's over a long period of time. So I don't need to tell you that it's a frustrating disease because it's not at all obvious, as Michelle was saying, exactly why it is one person gets Parkinson's um, and another doesn't. So th the question then, I suppose, is um, the, the first obvious place is to look at genetics. Um, and there's been intensive research looking at genetic causes. And of course, the OPDC has some of the most cutting edge research in exactly these questions. Um, so certainly there must be some um, influence of genetics, but um, from what we know so far, there's only a few genetic mutations that have actually been found to increase the risk. Um, certainly, that wouldn't, certainly not enough to explain the, the, the heterogeneity of, of different expression of symptoms of, of this disease. So um, in that case, perhaps Parkinson's is mostly due to what I would call phenotypic variation. So it might just be cellular variability might just be due to different expression levels of particular genes over time. This accumulates over time. And so that is what causes Parkinson's. Um, so there are many um, promising leads in this direction. For example, um, at, for example, being pursued at Oxford on the question of alpha-synuclein, um, the protein accumulation of this particular protein being one uh, uh, potential cause. Um, and Michelle mentioned uh, loss of smell. That seems to be a, a precursor in some cases. And yet another clue is, as Michelle um, talked about, and Harry's going to be talking about in a lot more detail later on, um, this rapid eye movement um, sleep uh, behavior disorder. But otherwise, the evidence so far seems to be quite weak. Um, we don't have a lot of strong evidence to show exactly what explains the variability of, of Parkinson's. So what about behavior? Um, does your lifestyle um, before you develop Parkinson's and as you um, uh, live with the disease for a period of time, um, does that influence it or not? And unfortunately, the answer pretty much is that no one really knows. And the reason why is because of the fact that it's not really been possible in the past to actually measure behavior objectively using anything other than infrequent surveys. So um, there's a survey that you can, you can do, part of the UPDRS um, uh, scale, for example, this Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, and part of it you could fill out yourself. But the data that we have on that pretty much is once every three months. So, of course, behavior is not what happens <coughs> when you do that survey. Behavior is everything else while you're not doing the survey. So, of course, we don't really have any objective information about that. And maybe there's an environmental influence as well, as well. Does where you live explain your risk? Now, there's some evidence to this effect. For example, farmers exposed to certain um, pesticides um, and other particular industrial toxins um, seem to have a higher risk than the general population. But again, we need a lot, a lot more evidence than that to, to associate environmental factors with this disease. Um, 
because all that we have so far is pretty much based on surveys. And again, that doesn't tell you the whole picture. For example, you could, for the whole of your working life, drive past a set of fields that are being sprayed with a particular pesticide. And the survey just looks at where you live. Of course, that completely misses the fact that you are being exposed to a potential toxin that could cause this disease. Um, so that would not be picked up by a survey. So some other approach is clearly needed here. So obviously, we're not going to get a complete picture of this disease until we combine at least these four at aspects, which is genetics, biology, behavior, and environment. So my particular research focus is on addressing the many technical problems that we face in recording behavioral and environmental factors. One of the biggest problems being the expense, the sheer expense of going about collecting this kind of data. Um, and we need to measure behavior and environmental um, factors over a long duration um, because we need to be able to see what happens when you're not at the clinic. Um, to make that possible, every part of the measurement process has to be as inexpensive as possible. Otherwise, we are simply going to run out of money before we ever get any kind of um, numbers to be able to actually do the statistics. But what I believe is that we're living in a rather miraculous era, actually, when technologies such as um, smartphones, which I'll be talking about later, um, uh, have really reached the point at which we could start to consider these as proper research tools for trying to address these kind of questions. And hoping that in by doing so, we can bring together this behavioral and environmental side of the research to complement the um, biological aspects of it. So our approach then in the research that we do is about adapting whatever measurement technology is currently widely available to participants. So um, do you want to put your hand up if you have a smartphone? So that's probably the majority of you do. Um, so what I'm talking about, things like commodity smartphones. Um, um, can you put a hand up if you have a telephone? <laughs> exactly. So that just gives you an example about how this consumer technology is already widely embedded in the community. Um, so, um, to, uh, how many of you, for example, have access to the internet and a PC? There you go. So, uh, it's just a point about the fact is that we all already have this technology available. So, what we're trying to do is to exploit this technology that you already have. Um, so, if we look at a smartphone, for example, um, it has built, they all have built-in movement sensors. So a movement sensor could allow, if you put it in your pocket, to capture your gait. So you put it in your pocket and just walk like this, it's actually picking up your gait. So we can look at movement patterns, so the way that your steps are changing, the asymmetry in the steps, the speed of your stepping, that kind of thing, we can, we can pick up with um, the sensors in a commodity smartphone. Um, they also have GPS devices in them, so that means that when you're outside, we can work out your exact coordinates. And so from that, we can use that information to look up in databases, environmental databases, to see where you were and how, that was, how you were influenced by your environment. And for example, we have a proximity sensor. So we know when this device is in your pocket and when it's not. So that means we can tell whether or not it's being potentially confounded by the fact that you just have the smartphone on the table. If it's in your pocket, it's mechanically coupled to you so we're picking up your movement behavior, not something else. And we work with um, organizations like um, Twilio, who have an interactive voice response system. So you can make a telephone call, and you can leave recordings of your voice, for example, with an automated system. And uh, a lot of this data is just collected by um, ubiquitous servers that's all open source. So this is pretty much free software and allows us to set up servers to collect the mountain of data that um, comes in through this route um, at very, very low cost. Um, so what this allows us to do then is to run really highly accessible trials for collecting this kind of data. So to give you an example of this, we ran uh, a study called the Parkinson's Voice, in Voice Initiative. where We were able to recruit nearly 17,000 participants in under six months for less than $1,000. So that gives you an idea about how, how cheap this can be. Um, and to reach out to large numbers of participants, um, we can find ways to try to mobilize um, everyone. 
to report their symptoms on a frequent basis, which can then be used as a baseline to compare to this kind of objective data being collected using, using smartphones. Um, now, I should just, I'm just going to, this is the only technical slide in my talk, <coughs> I promise you. Um, one thing I should, should give you some in, um, understanding about is the technology that goes on in the background, if you like. What happens to all this data when we collect it? How can we process it and turn it into something meaningful? Now, what I should say is that uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a law called Moore's Law, and it's widely appreciated that the cost and size of computing hardware halves every 18 months. So by now, a smartphone is basically more powerful than a 100-ton mainframe computer in the 1970s. I think you probably all know that. Uh, of course, a, a mainframe computer then would have filled a room. Now, if I plot on this, on this axis, the horizontal axis is the date, and the vertical axis, note that that's on a logarithmic scale, shows the time taken to perform a certain computation. And the top curve shows the improvement due to Moore's law. So you can see that's logarithm exponentially dropping. So the, the time taken to do that computation would be you know, a tenth of its, uh, um, when, we, when it started off, it was at um, 10 to the 7. Um, so that's 10 million seconds. And then by 1990, it's down to 1,000 seconds. So that gives you somehow, so just a comparison about how fast it is. But look at the other curve. Now the other curve here is, it's a, it's a well-kept secret actually, um, this is the curve that is due purely to um, our improvements in actually um, running, uh, designing algorithms that can process this kind of data. And the improvements in the algorithms mean, uh, have far outstripped Moore's law. So that means that we are in an era when we can really start to process this data on a, uh, an incredibly rapid scale. Um, for example, the signal processing techniques that we're using and so-called machine learning methods that try to that basically automatically understand this data and make predictions on clinical scales that can be used in research like this. And, it's, and of course, it's objective because the fact is that we are simply using the sensors in this device, and if you have the same behavior, it records the same thing. So I'll just end with this then. Uh, what I hope I've tried to convince you is that the technologies that are already available to all of you um, and that you have in your homes, in your pockets, um, can be extraordinarily effective at lowering the cost of trying to do, to collect the kind of data that is going to um, complement the very detailed phenotypic data that's being collected in a study like this in order to bring up aspects of it that are crucially important, I think, to understanding what varies in this disease and ultimately what causes it. Thank you very much. <laughs>